Zachariah Sitchin, in his book, of course, The Earth Chronicles, mentioned in the 12th Planet book that there's another planet in our solar system called Planet X, basically. Yes. Nibiru, that circles us every 3,600 years. It's That's in correct. that kind of elliptical orbit. And he claimed that the Anunnaki came from that planet, came down here, and seeded us. You've looked at the theory of Planet X, haven't you? I have. I spent a, a little bit over a decade specifically on just Planet X and, and the teachings of Sitchin. And obviously with any information or hypothesis, things evolve. Um, Sitchin will always be one of the great people to literally bring to focus Anunnaki or the term Nibiru, that mm -hmm. ancient Planet X. And the search for Planet X is really interesting, George, because mainstream science keeps putting it back on the radar. There are a lot of people that hear the term Planet X just from Sitchin and become instantly skeptical and say, well, right, you know, right. this is all mythological stuff in the past, but it's not. Our current science is continually, continually uh, are finding extrasolar planets or brown dwarfs or, or, or bodies that are in some intricate dance with our own solar system. And it brings up this question over and over. Is there a large body beyond Pluto that we still have to detect? And does it meet the criteria of this ancient planet X? And if it does, maybe there's people living on that planet. Sitchin read uh, cuneiforms from ancient Iraq, from the Sumerians. He interpreted it the way he felt he did. Right. Uh, but what I find fascinating about all of it is he talked about a collision between Earth and this other planet or something that was out there. Yeah. Today, scientists are saying the moon was created by a collision between Earth and another planetary object, which That's then right. formed the moon. That's right. Amazing, because he talked about this years ago. This is called the Orpheus theory, where a large extrasolar planet whacked our primitive Earth, and then and the debris the moon. Right, yeah. coalesced into our moon. Very close to what Sitchin says. And you know what's really interesting about the Sitchin hypothesis is we're looking for a planet that's four to eight times the size of Earth. So there have been all these other little ice balls or you know planets planetoids, that are planetoids. Planetoids, you know, yeah. Sedna, Quar, Zena, Pluto. We, <laughs> Pluto. Poor Pluto. But if we find one that's four to eight times the size of Earth, I don't think that's something that we would miss. Most of the amateur astronomers pick up things like Hale Bopp or Shoemaker Levy 9 that whacked that's Jupiter. Right well before the professional community. Some people, some conspiracy theorists say that we already know there's this planet out there and that they're afraid to tell us. Why would they be afraid to tell us? Well, you brought up something interesting, George, about you know, the, the past of Planet X. And geologically, we've heard of the term of Pangaea. Mm -hmm. And no one can really refute now that the continents are like a skin of an apple. They were all connected to and, one and large you can mass. See it's like a puzzle. Yeah. They fit perfectly. Right, and they all yeah. fit. The idea of Pangaea is right in alignment with the ancient Sumerian cosmology that this ancient planet whacked our primitive Earth, making it into half a planet and strewing out the asteroid mm -hmm. belt. So, again, I think it's just a matter of interpretation. And a lot of people have, have approached our history either from a religious or from a scientific viewpoint. Overlapping those, we're seeing massive crossover that we still have to investigate further and hope that our sciences can catch up to actually, you know, validate a lot of these things that were said in the past. Do you believe there's a Planet X out there? I firmly believe there's a Planet X. I think it's a little bit more complicated to answer based on new things that I've become interested in, which is this precession of the equinox. Okay. And, you know, looking at the idea that we're possibly a binary solar system, meaning not just one sun, two. Where is the other sun? Well, it could be a, a, a failed star at this point, a brown dwarf. So uh, you couldn't see it, basically. We can't right? see it, but there's all the evidence to suggest something's been hurling debris towards us. Even Dr. Richard Mueller at uh, Berkeley came uh -huh. up with the idea of nemesis, some planet that's orbiting that second sun that could and be dislodges. Planet X, right? It could be. So I definitely think that if we are going to look for the Sitchin Planet X and the modern Planet X, it's going to be a, an orbit Planet X that goes around two suns, and that obviously changes the orbital mechanics of what we've tr traditionally looked at from Nibiru and that 3600 orbit of that long elliptical orbit. It has to be looping around something else. You know? Are scientists looking for this Planet X? They are, and uh, 
you know, as you mentioned, is there, is there a cover-up? People are looking for it, but you know, to what degree they're labeling it the ancient Sumerian planet X, that's where it gets a little watery. The mm -hmm. Vatican has been looking. Uh, I know there's observatories in uh, Hawaii and in Australia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there, there's a vast array of things that the scientific community is looking at. I don't think they're always specifically looking for planet X, but there have been telescopes that they've purposed as planet hunters, and then they've been repurposed to look for specifically extrasolar planets, a planet X. Would they tell us if they found it? I don't know. I mean, if we look at some of the things that have happened in the past, NASA, National Aer Aeronautic Space Administration, also means never a straight answer. <laughs> now, not to point the finger at them, but some of these uh, galactic events like Shoemaker-Levy 9 broke up into large fragments and impacted Jupiter in such a way that it left Holes, holes that could fit four to eight Earths in each of these and little... thank God Jupiter was there to uh, take it. Yes, but NASA yeah. said, don't worry about it. It's not going to be anything interesting to see. Right. It was very interesting. Or it won't happen here, they thought. Right? Or it won't happen here, right. So, you know, I, I think everyone needs to pay attention to the space sciences that we're doing, Goddard Space Center, JPL, and other agencies around the world, Japan and Europe, that even as a layman, someone could pay attention and start to see patterns of what they're looking into from a corporate level and kind of where their focus will be over the next 10 to 20 years. So my, my uh, journey began uh, almost 80 years ago uh, when uh, I was about 10, 11, something like that. I was fortunate, and uh, I, I really mean that, that word, I was fortunate uh, to study the Bible, the Old Testament, in its original Hebrew language, because uh, every translation is really an interpretation. So, having studied uh, the, the Bible, the Old Testament, in its original Hebrew language, I uh, really uh, could understand uh, precisely what it said, and the Hebrew of the Old Testament is very, very precise. A word or a term is used exactly because this is what the uh, uh, redactor or authors of, of the Bible uh, intended to say. So we reached chapter 6 of Genesis. The Genesis starts with the story of creation, how heaven and earth were created, and so on. And then, uh, which by the way, as I showed in my book, uh, Genesis Revisit, really uh, dovetails uh, with our understanding of evolution. Uh, even uh, uh, dinosaurs are mentioned uh, in, in one of the verses of chapter one of, of Genesis, and that uh, uh, that the, there were fish that crawled to the dry land. All, all, all that is there in Genesis if you uh, know the Hebrew uh, and what it says. So then comes, of course, uh, uh, the chapter, uh, and the story is told twice, about how the Adam, the Adam, not Adam, but the Adam, Adam, which means the species, the species called uh, the Adam, which coming from the word Adama, uh, which in Hebrew means earth, it could really be or should be translated the earthling. How the earthling uh, came to be uh, in this process of, uh, of creation. And uh, he, he came to be a male uh, as a result of a deliberate decision by a group called Elohim, which uh, is translated, and here I'm illustrating how every translation is an interpretation, because it's translated God, God with a capital G, but the Elohim is a plural term, uh, the uh, singular is El or Eloha, uh, and, and it really coming from the Akkadian means simply the lofty one. So the Elohim is the plural which means the lofty ones said, let us, in the plural, fashion the Adam in our image and after our likeness. Plural, plural, plural. 
uh, in the translation, starting with the King James translation, it says, so God said, let me fashion the Adam, but this is not what the Bible says. So the Adam was fashioned, and there's the story of how Eve came about, and, uh, and uh, the, the tale in the Garden of Eden, uh, which uh, uh, can be uh, commented on and elaborated, and I did it in, in my book, so <coughs> I will not uh, dwell on it this evening. And then the story continues, and comes chapter 6 of Genesis, <coughs> and uh, uh, this is the story of the deluge, the great flood, uh, how Noah was told to uh, build the ship, the ark, and uh, the seed or the remnant of mankind uh, was saved from that great calamity. But uh, that uh, chapter 6 of Genesis and the story of Noah and the flood, etc., uh, is preceded by eight, eight verses uh, which have uh, stymied uh, biblical scholars and many, even some known scholars uh, who, who wrote commentaries on the Hebrew Bible, uh, if possible, skip over those eight verses as if you know, <laughs> they are not there. Just don't don't pay attention to it, because uh, those verses <coughs> uh, say that uh, uh, in the days before the flood, uh, the sons, the sons plural, of the Elohim, which is a plural term, let's say of the gods with a small g, the sons of the gods uh, took the daughters of the Adam as wives. Uh, any, any way they chose, and had children by them before the deluge and thereafter too. So there was this intermarriage between the, the sons of the gods <coughs> and the daughters of, of the Adam, uh, which produced children referred to as heroes, men, men of renown, etc. Uh, and when the teacher explained to us uh, what, what those verses say, uh, they start and say uh, to tell us, because the, the second verse, I believe, says that in those days the Nephilim were upon the earth. They were the sons of the gods. And they said that means giants. There were giants upon the earth in those days and thereafter too. So I raised my hand <coughs> and uh, said, uh, excuse me, my teacher, why do you say giants when the word nephilim comes from the verb nafol, which means to fall, to come down, to descend. So the, the word is not giants, the word means those who have come down in context from, from heaven to earth. And uh, I was uh, expecting uh, the teacher to say, uh, Sitchin, very good, very good, you know your Hebrew. Uh, and instead he reprimanded me very harshly. I, uh, as I said, it happened more than a few years ago. But, but I remember it as if it happened yesterday because he, he, he was so angry, he spoke through his teeth. He said, Sitchin, sit down. You don't question the Bible. And I went home that day very distraught because I was not questioning the Bible. On the contrary, I was pointing out the need to understand exactly what it says. So this word, Nephilim, Nephilim, um, <clears throat> became an obsession with me what does it mean? What did the Bible mean? Who, who were they? What does it mean, those who, who came down? Uh, and besides this, uh, which I later understood more, not, not when I was 10 or 11 years old, wh what is this business in the Bible uh, devoted to monotheism, the idea of one, one creator, one, 
one God. It talks about uh, the sons, plural, of the gods, plural. Uh, so this is what got me uh, into the subject. And then uh, I, I found out from, from studying, from reading, from learning, that uh, th those particular verses really reflect traditions of other people who, who preceded the Hebrews in the ancient Near East, and the, the so-called uh, legend, so-called mythology, and, uh, and there the, are the, the Greek myths, and there are other Greeks, uh, myths of, of Greeks and Romans and Hittites and other people, and gradually, gradually, it all took me back to where it all originated, which is in Sumer, the Sumerian civilization, uh, which uh, blossomed out uh, suddenly, and others used the, the word suddenly, unexpectedly, uh, without precedent, about 6,000 years ago in uh, Mesopotamia, which is today's uh, Iraq. <coughs> so um, in the course of the years, uh, I was asked <laughs> in questions like these, uh, sometimes, uh, and I ended up writing my books, etc. So I was asked the question, a very interesting question, uh, what would have happened if the teacher would not have reprimanded you? <laughs> if the teacher would have said, good, you're right, the Philim means those who came down, and I would sit down and be uh, happy, and would I ever get involved in this journey, uh, which started uh, 80 years ago and, and brought me uh, to, to talk to you this evening. Uh, the truth is I don't know, but, but uh, as I contemplate uh, where I am today at, at, uh, at this age, and uh, I sometimes ask myself, <coughs> Uh, why am I still here? <coughs> uh, I, uh, you know, as, as you can see, by the way, I don't have a teleprompter, and I have nothing written on my palms either. <coughs> so this is really a talk uh, uh, from the heart to to people I consider uh, friends. And uh, uh, my, my mother uh, died from leukemia at age 57. And my father uh, from a stroke at age 64. So I've, I frequently ask myself, why, why am I still here? And uh, uh, the only answer I give myself, and maybe uh, uh, I'm kidding myself, I don't know, but the only answer is, uh, which goes back to that question, uh, would I have gone through this journey of study and research uh, and writing the books, etc., etc., were the teacher to, to respond differently? Uh, so I really think that uh, the answer is yes. I probably would have followed the same route uh, because uh, that's what I meant uh, to do. That's right. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, the, this Nephilim business became, as I said, an obsession with me. And uh, to the extent that uh, there was hardly a, uh, a dinner at home uh, or, or, or a get-together or whatever, that uh, whenever some subject came up or, or, or there was some news item in the newspapers, that I would say, well, that, you know, that really uh, brings to mind, <laughs> and I would talk about the Nephilim, uh, until, uh, as I mentioned in the uh, dedication, 
uh, in one of my books, uh, uh, my wife, uh, uh, who passed away, told me, <coughs> uh, why don't you stop talking and start uh, writing about the, the Nephilim? Uh, so by the time uh, I was a journalist, so to write was not uh, uh, difficult for me. Though writing a book is, is quite different from writing a, an article. Um, but by the time I, I decided, yes, it's time to, to, to put it all, to put all this evidence uh, in, in book form, uh, by the time I, I reached that point, there were others already uh, that started to write about it. Uh, uh, one that uh, uh, continues to, to, to lead in this field uh, in his own style and his own way uh, is Eric von Daniken. And uh, as some of uh, you have attended uh, a lunch honoring me today, uh, he sent a, a, a very, very nice message. Uh, but if there, there were others before him. There was uh, uh, Charou in France. There was uh, uh, somebody called, uh, I think, uh, um, Jacques, Jacques something. Uh, that uh, his, his book in English is, is titled The Morning of the Magician. I don't know if any of you read it. So uh, others started to write. There was one in, in, in England uh, with whom I corresponded. Uh, so others started to write and promote the idea which became known as the ancient astronauts, that, that Earth was visited in the past by, by uh, people from, from somewhere else. And according to the Sumerians, they called them uh, uh, people who came from, uh, from a planet called Nibiru. So when it, it came time for me to, <laughs> to write, I said, it's, not, it's really not enough and not convincing to say, well, the, 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 if you understand the Bible, the, the, the way it's written, and if you, if you take more seriously some of the <coughs> myths, the, the mythology of ancient, other ancient peoples, uh, there the are stories about so-called gods They were more and more... Uh, uh, omnipotent beings, the, the, the Greeks called them the immortals, they, they, they lived forever, they, they, they could roam the skies, etc., etc. So these are the people uh, to whom the Bible refers in those uh, six or, or eight verses. <coughs> but I felt that, that that's not good enough, because if, if Earth uh, has indeed been visited by someone from somewhere else, it's not enough to say uh, from the heavens. What does heavens mean? There's got to be a solid place. There's got to be another planet. So, so from which other planet did they come? Uh, then comes the other question. If they did come from another planet, uh, were they some kind of space tourists that, that were uh, roaming the, 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 the universe and saw this little uh, round thing, a little uh, greenish or bluish or brown, and said, hey, let's, let's uh, stop there and take a look at it. And, and then, like tourists, and continued. Uh, they didn't like the, 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 the service and the food, so they <laughs> continued on their way. <coughs> Or were they perhaps uh, uh, involved in some accident and uh, crash landed and looked, you know, for uh, for some uh, solid ground where where they could land? So uh, uh, were they just passing? Did they uh, came, did they come here <coughs> as the result of an accident? Uh, no, the, 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 the evidence showed that they were coming and going. They were coming and going repeatedly over, over thousands, over tens of thousands of years. So why would anybody keep coming to this uh, tiny, tiny spot uh, in, 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 in the heavens? What for? What was the reason for their coming and going? So, so 
to me, this whole issue uh, of the so-called uh, myths and mythology became a matter of reasoning. I had to, to find the reason, so therefore the cover of the first book, The Twelfth Planet, I think uh, uh, and David in the back may have uh, one, one poster with, with uh, uh, reproduction of the original first cover, uh, had under it uh, not only that the earth was visited or whatever the wording was, that, but, but it said why, when, and from where did they come. And once I uh, started to, 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 to travel along this particular road, other things s seemed to me as, as issue that required better understanding. The, what, what does it mean, gods, with, with, with a small g? What, what does it mean, gods? The gods came, they did this, they did that. Who, who, who were they? Uh, how did they look? Uh, were, were they short? Were they tall? So uh, gradually and gradually, step by step, I reached the point where the so-called gods of antiquity, to call them by their Sumerian name, Anunnaki, literally meaning those who from heaven to earth came, <coughs> that they became for me real beings. So I discovered, for example, that the tale in the Bible about that in that chapter 6 of Genesis, uh, to which I will <laughs> keep, keep coming back and back, because it is a crucial, a crucial a tale in the Bible with, with many implications. <coughs> uh, in that chapter, uh, God, in the Hebrew God, Yahweh, uh, whose name, by the way, means I will be whoever I will be. Uh, and I can explain this a little later. Uh, looked at mankind as the deluge was about uh, to, to happen and uh, didn't like what he saw. He saw mankind uh, developed or evolved. And now there's so many of them, by the way, they filled up the earth. And there's only evil in their heart. This is the, the biblical verse. So when the deluge come, let the deluge wipe them off the face of the earth, and we'll be done with this uh, experiment, with this chapter. <coughs> and then in verse 9, the same Yahweh says, well, let me instruct my faithful servant Noah how to build an ark and save mankind. So this omnipotent God of the Bible, the monotheistic God, uh, suddenly appears like a guy who cannot make up his mind, right? <laughs> One minute he said, oh, let's get rid of them. And then he said, no, 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 but, but you, 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 you build a ship and you take this and that and board and, 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 and be saved and so that mankind should not perish. But when you go to the sources of this tale, the, the, the Sumerian text, which are available now because during 150 years of archaeological work, uh, others, not I, none, none of the tablets that I refer to in all my books have been found by me. I make no claim that I went to Iraq or wherever and that I was poking in the ground and look what I discovered. I did not discover anything. I'm just the one who went back to those tablets and said this is not mythology. This, these are records of events that had actually taken place. That's the only difference between me and all the other scholars in archaeology and biblical studies, etc. 
So when you go to, to the Sumerian sources and there are tales about the flood and how it happened and when it happened and who was Noah, etc., etc., you find that there were actually two, two so-called gods. Uh, one was called Enki, <coughs> which uh, literally means Enki, Lord of Earth, and the other one was Enlil, Lord of the Command. And uh, it was Enlil who uh, was unhappy with the way mankind turned out. But it was Enki who was involved in that decision, which is quoted in the Bible a chapter or two earlier, where the Elohim say, let us fashion the Adam in our image and uh, after our likeness. And that was Enki, Enki, the, the scientist among them, uh, who said, when they faced a certain problem and a mutiny, and it's very dramatic when, when you go back to the Sumerian sources, uh, he said, there's a way to uh, solve our problems by fashioning a primitive worker, by uh, genetically upgrading a being that already has evolved on Earth, on this planet called Ki. They called it Ki. Uh, and we can upgrade him and create the so-called earthling in the Bible. So Enki considered mankind as his uh, uh, children, as some of them, by the way, were, because he was one of the first ones to have sex with the daughters of men. Uh, so he was a great scientist, but he was also a great womanizer. <laughs> Uh, while Enlil was more a, a, the commander, a by-the-book guy, uh, except that he also got involved in date rape. So, <laughs> so I mean, it, 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 these are stories from thousands of years ago, but they are very up-to-date, by the way. So. so in the Sumerian text, it is two different leaders, one who says, let mankind perish, uh, and the other one says, no, uh, we, we will try, or he will try, uh, in a clandestine way, uh, to, to, to save mankind. <coughs> so as this uh, story continues, and then uh, the two, these two turns out were not real brothers, but were only half-brothers. And, and uh, it depended, uh, so they had the same father, the king, the ruler on Nibiru, the planet from which they came, uh, was the father of both, but they had different mothers. And then it turned out that there are rules of succession. So if uh, one of the sons was a son by a wife who was a half-sister, he had uh, priority. He, he was the crown prince, uh, even if he was not the firstborn. So there's all these problems. Turn, to turn up as I research and research. So more and more and more to me, they become real, real beings, real entities, uh, uh, and so on. As the tales became more and more a reality for me, uh, not only did I uh, decide that one book, the, the first book, The Twelfth Planet, uh, which, which uh, uh, I, I must tell you, I, it took me 30 years to write it. And, and uh, in the end, uh, uh, the book that was published was only about a f uh, one third of the manuscript because the, the editor uh, uh, was a very good editor, a young woman, <laughs> uh, kept telling me, Shorten it, shorten it, shorten it. Uh, and I said, uh, well, uh, to, to prove my point, uh, I'm quoting this text and this text and this text. And she said to me, look, when somebody starts to read the book, after the first chapter or so, they'll make up their mind. Either you know what you're talking about or you don't know what you're talking about. So I told her, yes, but as I say this or that, it's as if 
the, the, the professors, my mentors, etc., are looking over my shoulder and saying, Sitchin, where did you get that? So I say, well, there, 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 there's this tablet that, that says it. And, and to this guy, I say, well, there's this tablet that says it. So she says to me, one, <laughs> one example is enough because the reader either will say, you make sense or you, or, 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 or you don't make sense. So, uh, so of course, I had material uh, for a second book. And the second book after uh, The Twelfth Planet was uh, The Stairway to Heaven, which uh, also dealt with, with the Egyptian evidence, not, not just the Sumerian. And uh, what I said in, in, in that uh, uh, book, in the second book, was that uh, uh, things changed after the deluge, after the flood. Uh, the relationship between, uh, I'll call them gods, with, with a small g, simply for simplicity of, of conversation. So, so the, the relationship between the gods and, and the earthlings that they created changed completely because to, to go on staying on earth, they, they now needed the cooperation. So they decided to give uh, the humans, the earthlings, civilization, knowledge, etc., etc. Et so uh, <coughs> as, as, as this relationship uh, changed, also the, 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 the geography changed as a result of the deluge. So uh, in, 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 in pre-diluvial times, uh, the spaceport, the landing uh, corridor were, were, were this way, anchored on, on the two most prominent peaks in, uh, in the Near East, <coughs> the twin peaks of Ararat, Mount Ararat has two peaks uh, this way into Iraq, Mesopotamia, and that was covered totally by uh, billions of tons of mud. Everything was wiped out. So after the deluge, the, <coughs> the pattern was different, and the pattern still was anchored in the twin peaks of Ararat, but went <coughs> this way <coughs> and uh, needed artificial peaks at the end on which to anchor, and, and we, we know them as the Great Pyramids, the two Great Pyramids of Giza, they were the, the, the terminal anchor, and, 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 and this way, and the spaceport <coughs> that used to be before the deluge in Mesopotamia uh, was now in the Sinai Peninsula, uh, with the landing patterns starting so they would come if they land from come from the uh, up on, on the Ararat and go down and land in the in the Sinai, uh, and I became quite familiar with the geography and topography of the Sinai, and was uh, writing writing the, the second book, and then one night I woke up with a nightmare because suddenly the thought occurred to me. Since the, the, the plain, the valley, where the spaceport, according to my conclusions, was, uh, let's say that this is the, 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 the valley surrounded by mountains, uh, and I say that the spacecraft came this way and landed, <laughs> now, what if there are high mountains here? And, and no spacecraft could come down here. And I'm writing a book saying that, that this was it. So <coughs> I went to Israel, <coughs> which then uh, controlled the Sinai Peninsula, and chartered a plane and used all the connections that I could find uh, to get permission from the military, because the Sinai was a, a military zone. Uh, to approve a, a flight pattern. And the flight pattern was such that uh, I would take off from, uh, from Tel Aviv, which is on the Mediterranean, and fly to uh, <coughs> Jerusalem, which I said was the new mission control center. And then from Jerusalem, I would emulate this descending pattern and see <laughs> if there's any way to, to, to land. <clears throat> or will I end up crashing? And uh, 
I, I was the only passenger in the, in the aircraft with a, a military pilot and a military li liaison officer. And lo and behold, there were all these mountains. And as we were nearing, it turns out that the mountains as if parted. There was some kind of opening between the two mountains precisely where I said uh, the landing uh, path is. And uh, I, I, I realized that uh, my conclusions uh, you know, would, would, would stand up uh, uh, on site examination and wrote the second book. <coughs> uh, that experience has, uh, has led me to uh, a feeling that it is <coughs> very important <coughs> not just uh, to write about places, but to go and be at those places. Now, um, uh, and at one, uh, uh, after going myself to, uh, I, I don't remember, or, or the, <laughs> I'm not going to bother with how many places I went to uh, all over, with the exception of Iraq. I, I was everywhere. Uh, because I, <coughs> they, when people ask me, why don't I go to Iraq, can't I get a visa? I said, the problem is not going to Iraq. The problem is getting out <laughs> uh, in the time of uh, Saddam Hussein. So, um, so I was everywhere without. And then I in time started uh, to take some uh, groups uh, with me. And uh, uh, th those who went with me, I think to this day, uh, uh, keep telling me when they have the chance that uh, uh, th th those tours were uh, the highlight, the highlight of their life. Uh, because we went uh, where <coughs> really a few others go. <coughs> And uh, uh, we, 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 we stood, we, we looked, for example, to give you a, an example which you, you might visualize, there's the famous story of Troy, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, in Homer's Iliad, which uh, uh, archaeologists and other uh, scholars always uh, poo pooed as, as a, a myth, you know. <clears throat> and then one guy I called uh, Schliemann, uh, who was wealthy enough to, to finance uh, the archaeological digging by himself, he went to the site that was mythologically rumored to be Troy and, and found Troy and found evidence of the whole story of the Iliad. Uh, so in one of our uh, trips with, with the group, we, we went to Troy and I climbed the, uh, the, the topmost mountain uh, or hill there because I wanted to see with my own eyes whether the tale in Iliad that the uh, Trojans have seen the Greek fleet arrive on the coastline, whether it's feasible, whether you could really stand and, and see the coastline. And though the coastline has receded, the answer was yes. So going to these places, became part of my research, uh, not just to see, but sometimes to, to, to feel. Uh, if I'll say uh, to feel what? To feel uh, uh, the vibrations. I may sound uh, uh, like uh, speakers in other rooms today. <laughs> but uh, but, but you, you do get some kind of feeling where are you? Could, could the things that supposedly happened there, could they, could they happen there? <coughs> and, uh, and that was uh, also uh, uh, very important. So uh, uh, the, 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 my own personal journey, therefore, uh, the, the depended on and at the same time made possible their realization that uh, the so-called ancient gods of whom the Sumerians said that they spoke about, called them Anunnaki, 
uh, meaning those from heaven to earth came, uh, etc., etc. Th th these are reality, it's all reality. <coughs> uh, which now brings uh, uh, me and us uh, to the question of uh, uh, from, from, so from where do they come? And uh, the answer that by given by the Sumerians was from a planet called Nibiru. <coughs> now, uh, uh, the name Nibiru and the notion that it is a name of a planet uh, is not my invention. <coughs> uh, there are very detailed astronomical tablets uh, there are details of observations in Babylonian times, in Assyrian times, that na name the planet and indicate its location, etc., etc. So at the end, at, uh, by the turn of the previous century, not the 20th, but the, the 19th century, when all these tablets became legible and understandable, uh, there were, in that time, in that case in Germany, uh, two really uh, giants of scholars who, who could both read the, the tablets and uh, who could understand them, please, and, and uh, uh, who also were astronomers. Both of them were Jesuit priests. As, as a side remark, I will tell you that it is Jesuit priests who run the observatory of the Vatican. I don't know how many of you know that the Vatican has an observatory. Do you know where it is? In Arizona. In Arizona. Yes, there's a building in Rome that is called the Vatican Observatory, but the real one is in Arizona. And I've been, and that's another story, uh, so I'll, say it in case I forget it later. Uh, and, and, and it, it's, I, I also wrote, in addition to all the, the, the usual books, also two autobiographical books about the journeys, the travels, etc., and, and whom I met, it, and so on. And, and it is now run <coughs> by a Jesuit priest called Father Funes, and I uh, corresponded with him, etc. And I, uh, he was in charge of the observatory in Arizona. Now is the, the, <coughs> the spokesman of the Vatican on the subject of extraterrestrials. And by the way, the Vatican is all for it. Uh, he says, uh, to, to deny the existence of extraterrestrials is the, to deny the existence of God with the capital G. So, um, uh, if you wonder why, I'll, uh, I'll let you uh, figure it out. Uh, the Vatican doesn't do anything without a reason. <coughs> so, uh, so there is a planet called Nibiru, and those two Jesuit priests uh, argued. And one of them said that, uh, uh, well, if you read uh, the, the, the tablets that describe its location, its appearance, uh, it's when it's visible, when it's not visible, etc. So it's just another name for Jupiter, because the assumption has been that the ancient peoples were not aware of any planet beyond Saturn with the naked eye, without telescopes. <coughs> and the other guy, uh, the, also the Jesuit priest, said, no, 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 if you read this and this and this, then it's another name for Mars. And I forget which book I was <laughs> writing at, at that particular point, but I felt that I cannot proceed with saying, answering that question, from where did they come, unless I figure out which planet it is. I mean, did they come from Mars or did they come from Jupiter? Now, at that time, uh, and still today, we, we know that Jupiter is, is, is a hot planet, emits more, more heat than, than it gets from the sun, and uh, presumably no life and no intelligent beings could, could develop and exist on it. And Mars at the time 
I'm now talking the, the first book was published uh, more, more than 35 years ago in 1976. So uh, uh, Mars was supposedly a dead planet uh, without air, without water, no, no life could exist on it. So uh, from, from where did they come? And, um, and one night uh, I woke up with the answer. Now, uh, did the answer come because I asked for it? Uh, because literally, and this is a, a true story, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that particular night before uh, going to sleep, I sat on my bed and said, Anunnaki, if you exist, <laughs> tell me which planet is Nibiru. And in the middle of the night, I woke up with the answer, there is one more planet. And I immediately jumped to all the material and said, of course, of course, there is one more planet. The Sumerians know about it with this uh, orbit, uh, elliptical orbit, etc. So when I put it in, in, in my first book, uh, one of the criticisms of the book was that the notion that a large planet can orbit the sun, our sun, in a vast elliptical orbit is ridiculous because such an orbit cannot be sustained. Sooner or later, that elliptical orbit will either eject the planet from the solar system or attract it to the sun and it will crash into the sun. So now uh, about 300, 400 so-called extra solar planets have been discovered, planets orbiting other solar system. And if you read the scientific literature, which I do because I'm a member of this and subscribe to that, etc., etc. They say that elliptical orbits are the norm. <laughs> so what was ridiculed before is now the norm. Now when the Sumerians said that Mars served as a way station, a group called the Igigi, those who observe and see, were stationed not on Earth, they were stationed on Mars and shuttling craft between Mars and Earth. Uh, that was also said that's impossible because nobody could live on Mars without water and without air. So um, though I do not have uh, today slides to show you, I did choose uh, two uh, visuals. Uh, which are here. Two. Oh, okay. <laughs> one on this side and one on this side. Okay. Now this one, <coughs> we, we, we made a few posters, actually only 50 of them, uh, depicting these two these two illustrations, which are really like the bookends, like one part of the tale and then the, 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 the ending part of the tale. <coughs> and there uh, you also have the caption. I autographed all of them. Uh, the caption says here, this is a Sumerian cylinder seal from 2500 BC. Okay. M mysteriously, the poster appeared. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, so the, this one is from a Sumerian depiction from uh, 2500 BC, 4500 years ago. Uh, and it shows uh, an Anunnaki, eagle man. Uh, that's how their astronauts were depicted. The uniform, they had like wings on their uh, uniform and in the 12th planet, I mentioned that uh, when our ast astronauts landed on Earth, the, the first word, so words were, the eagle has landed, if you recall. So these were the eagles or eagle men. 
and uh, he is uh, on the seventh planet. You see the seven dots here, one, two, three, four, five, seven, uh, which was the symbol or the number for Earth. <coughs> now we would consider Earth as the third planet or the third rock from the sun if you are uh, up to date on, on the lingo. Uh, and because there is uh, Mercury, Venus, and then, and then Earth. But if you are coming into our solar system from the outside, uh, then Pluto is the first, and then uh, Neptune and Uranus and Saturn and, and Jupiter, Mars would be the sixth, and Earth would be the seventh uh, with its moon. So, so this guy is, uh, is on Earth, and he is <coughs> greeting, is greeting, he's saying hello uh, to someone who is on the sixth planet. Right. Uh, and uh, he is dressed differently because being on the sixth planet, which is Mars, uh, the air is not uh, suit suitable or sufficiently enriched with oxygen, so he is wearing a mask. Uh, so one here on this planet greets one of that planet on Mars, and there is something in the sky in the heavens between them, uh, which to me looks like a spacecraft uh, with extended panels and so on. And if somebody says it's not a spacecraft, then I say, so what is it? Because some who criticize uh, these drawings, which are not mine, this is, this is a, a depiction on a cylinder seal, which is at the Hermitage Museum, in St. Petersburg in Russia. So um, I always challenge them. If they say, no, no, this, this doesn't show that, I say, OK, so you tell me what does it show, which they, they cannot explain otherwise. So there's a spacecraft uh, between them. And uh, on this particular cylinder seal, there is a date. And I will, um, I will come back. To, to, to the date of when these two, I mean, the seal is from 2500 BC, doesn't mean that this event that they depict uh, took place then, it took place at a different time. So this is uh, between Mars and, uh, Mars and Earth with the, with the spacecraft. <coughs> now, <coughs> if you turn uh, to this one, <coughs> this one is uh, from Mexico. Uh, this is a Mayan, a Mayan depiction, uh, and you see a Mayan chieftain uh, lying, or uh, I don't know why he's lying, maybe he's uh, uh, ill, maybe he's dying, I don't know. But anyway, he's being greeted or he's being addressed by uh, the chief Mayan deity uh, called uh, Quetzalcoatl or sometimes called Kukulkan. In both instances, it means the same thing, which means the, the winged or plumed serpent. And if you compare this one uh, to this one, uh, you'll see that the one from uh, 250 BC actually is showing you the same one as the one uh, on the other side of the world from 2000. 500 BC. And now uh, we know a little about Mayan glyphs, and he is speaking, uh, the, this god, uh, the, 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 the wing god, is speaking to the Mayan chieftain, and this means speaking, and, and he points at 10 planets. Now, uh, though uh, my, my book, uh, my first book is titled The Twelfth Planet, uh, this is really an abbreviation because it is, uh, I, I told the publisher, uh, his name was Stein, Stein and Day, I said, the, the, this is the twelfth member of the solar system because the Sumerians said the solar system consists of the sun, the moon, and ten planets. So this is the tenth planet, but it is the twelfth member, and which is the significant thing, because from that twelfth comes 
the 12 months, the 12 Olympian gods, the 12 tribes of Israel, the, the, the 12 uh, disciples of Jesus. This, uh, this is the origin of 12. That's why the 12, uh, that's why the, the book was entitled The Tenth Planet, but the 12th planet. But, but uh, as planets go, it is the 10th planet. So he says to him, I am, either I am or I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, the tenth planet, because this is a depiction of uh, the god, the Mayan god, living, living. <coughs> Which brings me uh, to, to this uh, uh, subject of 2012. The so-called Mayan calendar, uh, on which this whole business of 2012 is based, is really not a Mayan calendar at all. Uh, this is a calendar that's called uh, by, by scholars the, the long count calendar, uh, which began to count the number of days, day one, day two, day three, day four, count the number of days from a certain date which scholars have determined was uh, uh, some day, I think, uh, the, the 13th, uh, I mean equivalent in our calendar, to the 13th of August, 3113, 3113 BC. And from then it comes day one, day two, day three, day four, with, with, with all kinds of glyphs that depict. And the glyphs uh, start with one glyph uh, called Kin, K I N, which is means day, D A Y, day, and and goes up to twenty from one to twenty. Now twenty days, twenty days of a kin uh, become, uh, if I pronounce it right, an uinal, and and then there is a, a third term, and uh, which is called tun, and then there is another one called back to and, and, and so on, each time increasing, increasing <coughs> by, by multiples of days. So the, 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 the Mayan uh, scientists of, of today figure out, say, when a monument was uh, uh, set up by the Mayans by counting the number of days, deducting back to 3,113 BC, and therefore they say, so, so a monument like this is from about 250 uh, BC. <coughs> so the whole business of, of 2012 is based on the, on the notion that uh, one of the count uh, in, 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 the, in the long term uh, called Bakhtun, uh, which is equivalent to 144,000 days, that uh, is, is about to reach its 13th cycle uh, in December 2012. And someone uh, a few years back <coughs> got into his mind that uh, according to the Mayans, uh, the, the world will end on that day. Uh, the Mayans uh, left <laughs> very, very few uh, long written records. There's only one, one book uh, uh, called Chilam Balam that tells supposedly their history as they told it to the Spaniards. Uh, but that long count uh, that started in 3113 BC, uh, even those who, who say that it predicts uh, the end uh, in, in 2012, uh, if you ask them what, what happened, what happened in 3113 BC. So if we say that we are now today in, in the year 2010 <coughs> AD, which means Anno, Anno Domini, or uh, some prefer to say CE, Christian era, um, uh, we say, well, okay, that's counting the years from the time of the birth of Jesus. 
we, everybody, including the Vatican now, agrees that Jesus was not born on, on, on in year one, maybe six years earlier, but it doesn't matter. The, the, that's the system. So we, the count is from some kind of an event. Something happened, and there were other calendars that, that count from, from something. So when, in, in the same logic that I said, if they came from, where did they come? Uh, if they kept coming and going, why did they keep coming and going, etc.? I said to myself, what happened in 3113 BC? Now, you can take any Mayan book, any of those 2012 or whatever, you will not find the answer. <coughs> well, I found the answer, and I found the answer, and it's my book titled The Lost Lambs, which was dealt with this whole issue already in 1993, which is uh, a few years back. So, uh, <coughs> And that is, is linked in my mind with the question, who was this god, Quetzalcoatl? Who was the, the, the plumed serpent? Why is he depicted by the Mayans exactly the way the Sumerians depicted a, a Sumerian god? <coughs> so my research, my conclusion was that it's really a god uh, that uh, the Egyptians, an Egyptian god, who was also, uh, also had a Sumerian no uh, name, uh, in English Sida. The, uh, the Egyptians called him Toth, uh, which gets shortened like in this famous uh, pharaoh, Tutankhamen. Tut is really Toth. It, in, in English, they shortened it to Tut. Uh, so Tut, Tut, Toth, Toth, uh, uh, Toth. <laughs> Is, is the life of Amen. <coughs> so, um, and he had uh, a quarrel uh, with his brother. His brother was uh, the Egyptian god Ra, uh, who was known to the Sumerians as, as Marduk, <coughs> the Bab eventually the, the prime Babylonian deity. And uh, he was expelled from Egypt. He was, his expul expulsion coincided with the beginning of pharaonic rule in Egypt because according to Egyptian inscriptions, there was a time when only the gods uh, reigned over Egypt and then there were demigods and then dynastic uh, pharaohs began to, to rule around, around if you read in in books on Egyptology around 3100, 3100 BC. And I said, well, <laughs> if you go to the Mayan, to the long, long count calendar of the Mayas, which is really a calendar started by African looking people who settled in Mesoamerica uh, at about that time. Uh, I now know the precise date when Toth was expelled to Egypt and took some of his followers with him to what we call the New World, it was August 3113 BC. So to me, the, all, all the events, the so-called Mayan tales and, 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 and Aztec tales and in South America, the Incas, to me, this is all one, one package. I mean, these are the same gods, just called differently by names that mean the same in this language or that language or that language. And therefore, <coughs> I say that in order to understand the so-called Mayan prophecies, uh, which are really uh, an artificial creation, there's no such thing as Mayan prophecies uh, written and no record that one can read and say, like a Sumerian clay tablets, uh, in order to understand what happened in Mesoamerica, you have to understand what happened elsewhere in Sumer, in Egypt, in, in South America, uh, even in Europe, 
at, at, at some later days. <coughs> so in, in, in regard to 2012, the, uh, the, the, the point is, and I, I don't have it, uh, neither slides nor on this plane, is that as this long count calendar counts the number of days <coughs> starting <coughs> with uh, um, a kin for 20, or Nile for 20 times eight, uh, 18, and then comes Tun, which is 360 times 20, and then it goes to uh, Baktun, which supposedly will end the world on, on its 13th completion. But after the Baktun comes another <laughs> sign, the multiple of Baktun, times 20, which is called Piktun. And after the Piktun comes a sign times 20, which is called something else. So this whole notion that any, anybody in Mesoamerica said <coughs> the world will end at some date is, uh, the word starts with the B. <coughs> <coughs> uh, so, um, uh, so what, what, is, what, is, what does the day tell us? So if one wants to say, with all that, with all that, maybe there is something, you know, who, who knows? There's always the who knows thing. So the question that I already dealt, uh, dealt with it in my book in 1993 is, uh, since this is a count of days, so many days, and a, a, a Baktun is 144,000 days, if you want to calculate the number of years, you say convert days into years, so the 2012 is arrived at by dividing the number of days into 365 and a quarter, which is how many days it takes the the Earth to orbit the Sun one time. And if you divide that, you arrive at 2012. But if you look at the structure of this calendar, the, the, the long count calendar, you see that the multiples are 20 times 18, 360. So the basis of the count is 360. This is a mathematical calendar. And if you divide the number of days, not into 365 and a quarter, but into 360, you end up with the number for the end of the 13th Baktun in 2087. So my first uh, conclusion, <laughs> Uh, not the last one, the first one on the subject of, of, of this calendar to you is sleep easy because if it is true, you have time till 2087. <laughs> okay, so uh, I hope you appreciate that I gave you all these years. <laughs> Now, but this, this long count calendar is the calendar of people who came from Africa with, with Toth. And one of the problems, problems that Mexican archaeologists had for a long time, finally they, they admitted it, is that the colossal stone heads depicting, depicting African chieftains were found all over Mexico. And uh, at first it was hushed, uh, hushed, hushed, and uh, very embarrassing. What, what are you know, <laughs> African chieftains doing uh, among us uh, Spaniards, etc.? And now it's uh, it's admitted, and <coughs> some of the places my my group went with me. We went to some of the uh, fantastic museums that that have all these items from the Olmecs. It's called the Olmec people. On, the, on display. <coughs> but the Mayans uh, did have their own 
two calendars, not one calendar. There are two calendars. Uh, one is called the Hab, uh, and one is called the Tzolkin. And uh, the Tzolkin, which comes to, from the word kin, which meant today, Tzolkin, count of days, was a calendar that was completed every 260 days. Every 200, it was like, like a round, sometimes depicted with, with uh, teeth, like a wheel with teeth that, that, that turns. And the other one that fitted into it was of 365 days, which is called the Hab, which is really another name for Toth, and was really a, a, a copy of the Egyptian calendar, which was 18 times 20, 360 plus final five days. Now, when the two calendars turned, meshing into each other, the return to the same spot <coughs> after so many days that made up 52 years. <coughs> so in, this, in, in the Mayans called 52, and also the Aztecs called 52 years a bundle. They call it a bundle. <coughs> and then I find out that 52 in Egyptian lore, in Egyptian records, was the secret number of Toth. Our friend here, uh, the so-called uh, Kukulkan or Quetzalcoatl. So, uh, and according to the lore that is recorded, is that one day, like all the other gods in Sumer, in Babylon, uh, Babylonia, etc., uh, one day they left, and. Uh, if I forget, remind me to deal with their <laughs> departure. Uh, but he, in particular, told the Mayans, I'm leaving, but I will return. And I will return on day one of this bundle. So when 52 years are completed, that's the day on which I will return. And therefore, <coughs> In 1915, when Cortes landed in Mexico, uh, the, the Aztec king, uh, Montezuma, thought that Cortes, who had a beard, by the way, uh, white and bearded, exactly like Quetzalcoatl, that the god has returned because 1519 was exactly the day when the bundle of 52 years was completed. And, of course, Cortes was not the returning god, and <coughs> Montezuma uh, paid for it. So, if you say, if you say that let's forget the end of the world, but let's say that all these beliefs, predictions, or whatever, have to do with when the gods will return. How about trying that? I mean, something important will happen. So if you take 1519 as one year in which the bundle was completed and keep adding five, 52 and 52, 10 times 52, 520 years, etc. If I remember correctly, you arrive at 2091 as the date of the return, if it's to happen on, on, on a bundle, on the bundle year, which 2091 uh, is not, uh, in, in my opinion, being 90 years old, that uh, it's not so different from 2087. So. <laughs> would, you, would you go along with that? <laughs> okay. So, so uh, if we look at these predictions, we are really looking at the, towards the end of this century, 2087, 2091, uh, whatever. And we say, well, if uh, uh, it's not the end of the world, maybe it's the day when the... Uh, uh, 
those people hoped the predictions or the promise of the return, because there's no doubt from all the available records that Quetzalcoatl said, I will return. Yeah, we hope he's an honest guy and <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll keep his word. <coughs> so now we, we, go, we go to the parallel and much older uh, Sum Sumerian one. <coughs> now, uh, uh, if you go back to the road that I personally traveled of visualizing the so-called gods as, as individuals, as people uh, who came from one planet to another planet and, and had uh, this problem and that problem and that ambition and so on and so forth. So in, in trying to visualize that, and I used to do that with, with closed eyes, sitting with my hands <laughs> behind my head and, and trying with closed eyes to figure out, to figure out what are they doing, what are they saying, what, what does it mean? What, what do they mean? <coughs> um, so you, 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 you have now to imagine that these are uh, people coming from their planet. Now, their planet has an orbital period that I figured out and explained in my books why, that at that time, now it's a slightly shorter, but at that time was mathematically 3,600 years, because it varies from orbit to orbit. <coughs> now, what is 3,600 years? To them it is one year, because what is a year? A year, they say a year has passed, what does it mean a year has passed for us? That our planet made one orbit around the sun, so if they live on another planet, call it Nibiru or whatever you want to call it, and it uh, orbits the sun one, one time, so to them it's a year. That's where this whole notion of the immortality of the gods promulgated by the Greeks came, came into, into being. Uh, I sometimes say that if flies, if flies in my home uh, could talk, then Papa Fly would tell Sunfly you know, this, this Mr. Sitchin, he is immortal because my father, that is the fly talking, told me that, that his father, we flies as far as we remember, he, he's always there, he's, he's, he's immortal. <coughs> so, so these people come from their planet, leading their life, etc., and land on, on our planet, and imagining me being with them in that first landing group that splashed down in the Persian Gulf and waded ashore. And they say, w w watch this crazy planet, you know. It, it, in one year, it, it, it runs like mad around the sun. So, so they had to, to create some kind of a, of, of, of a time scale, you know, some, some kind of a watch to look at it and say, well, the passage of time, we, we cannot count our being on this planet and doing this and doing that and reporting back home, etc. In, in terms of Nibiru and say, one, it's one year because this planet has already orbited 3,600 times and, and it turns on its axis and there's daytime and nighttime and winter and summer. I mean, <laughs> you know, you can go crazy. So. <coughs> So they notice, they notice being uh, quite advanced, especially astronomically. They no notice the phenomenon that supposedly uh, the Greeks, the Greeks around the second century BC, were the first one to observe, which is not so, but anyway. And that is called the phenomenon of precession. The phenomenon of precession is that as our planet orbits the sun once and completes a year, it returns not precisely to the same spot where it started. 
It's explained by wobble, all kinds of other explanations. The truth is nobody really knows the reason. But this is a fact. It's called the precession of the equinoxes. <coughs> so there is some kind of a retardation. It returns, but not precisely to where it started, to a little less. And the little less accumulates to one degree of 360 in a circle, which is, by the way, Sumerian contribution to our civilization. The whole algebra, etc., comes from them. Uh, accumulates to one degree in 72 years. So the Anunnaki said, OK, here's what we'll do. We will divide the circuit of the heavens around the Earth. Uh, and, and look at the stars and, and group them and say this is the constellation of, of, uh, of the bull, of Taurus, and this is the constellation of the lion, and, and so on and so forth, and divide it into 12, 12 by 12, I mentioned before, the, the 12, uh, 12 this, 12 this, 12 this, and divide it into 12, and therefore, if the retardation is one degree in 72 years, so a twelfth of 360 is 30, 30 degrees. So the shift from one, what they call then this celestial station, and we call it the zodiac, one shift from this to this 30 degrees takes 30 times 72, which is 2,160. So now they created a, 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 a clock, a time scale, that, that takes the movements of the Earth around the Sun and relates it to the heavens. And then they said, if our planet, in terms of Earth, it's all mathematical, takes 3,600 years. So there is a ratio here, 3,600 to 2,160 is precisely 10 to 6, which if you studied architecture or other things, you know, is the so-called golden uh, median or, or whatever, <coughs> 10 to 6. And this is the basis that nobody else explained except me in my books, of the Sumerian mathematical system, which is call, called sexagesimal, which is 6 times 10 times 6 times 10. So it's 6, sexagesimal means base 60. 60 is like 1. And then it shifts to the other. So 6 times 10 is 60 times 10, 360. 3,600, and, 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 and so on. So in my book, in my book, When Time Began, I, I gave three names. I said there is earthly time, which is our time, one year, one month, etc. And then there is divine time, which is the time of the Anunnaki, the planet Nibiru. And then there is celestial time, the combination of the two, this ratio of 10 to 6. So for the Anunnaki to, to, to relate to, to our time, there is now a new calendar, a new, a new watch called the Zodiac of 2160, 2160. Mathematically, I keep stressing the word <coughs> mathematically. So now their time scale, when they say this happened at such and such a time, they say the deluge happened in the age, we call it the age, the age of the lion. Uh, the, the reign of the supremacy, supremacy of the gold called Enlil was in the age of the bull, the Taurus. Uh, the age of Enki is Pisces. <coughs> and, 
and, and they, they again named it after 12 of them. So if you look at this depiction, uh, there's a date on it. So at some time when the age was Pisces, this encounter between a, an astronaut on Earth and an astronaut on Mars had taken place. <coughs> but this is a cycle that keeps repeating itself. And, and this is the, the, the essence of what one should understand in trying to, to deal with all these issues, the, the end of days, the end of time, uh, the return, etc. That we must deal with a circular, with a circular situation and not with a linear one. Uh, so if you recall, there was great excitement uh, when the year 2000 came, right? That's the, the, when things will happen, nothing will happen. That for some reason, which I don't know, somebody say, invented 2003, the end will come in 2003. So all, all these are linear ones. So whether it's 2010 or 2012, this, this, uh, again, I, d I don't say that in 2087 or whatever, nothing will happen. I say, but this is not the, the, the clock. This is not the clock that's ticking in, in, the, in the title of, of my talk. The clock that's ticking is the zodiac is ticking. The zodiac is ticking. And after this cycle that takes about 26,000 years, or 25,920 to be precise, 12 times 2,160, 2, we, we are back. If it was once in Pisces, we are now back in Pisces. So if you combine this and this promise to return, you, you, you have every reason to expect the return, the return of the Anunnaki, not of the planet, but of the Anunnaki, because they come and go <laughs> many times in due, during one orbit <coughs> in, this, in this century, in, in, in this zodiacal period, which is the age of Pisces, will end by the end of this century, which again links with 2087-2091. Now, one of those, one of those who spent a lot of time, <laughs> more time than, than me, uh, on the subject of what, what does it mean, the end of days? Now, the end of days, which in, in Hebrew, in the Bible, is called Aharit Ayamim, uh, literally, the, the end of days. So other translations, the end of time, and these are not accurate. Uh, is already mentioned in the book of Genesis <coughs> when Jacob, when the Hebrew patriarch Jacob uh, wa was uh, on his deathbed, he called his 12, his 12 sons <coughs> and said, I will predict for each one of you the end of days, Aharit, what will happen not to you, but to your descendants, to your offspring at the end of days. And then again, uh, the prophets dealt, and I did my best in, in my books, in my book, uh, especially the one titled The End of Days, and, and in my talks to, to, to make a distinction, because the prophets, the Hebrew prophets, made a distinction between what they called or translated, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is, is when the planet returns. And the last time was around 550 BC. Uh, and and the, end, the end of days, the, end, the, the zodiacal clock, when the return, when Zion will be rebuilt, when Zion will be the beacon to all the nations when there will be uh, peace on earth, where, when the lamb shall, shall dwell with, with the, with, with the uh, fox or <laughs> whichever animal uh, uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chose to, to mention. And, and the, 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 the latest 
part in, in the Old Testament dealing with it is the book of Daniel, which is really the precursor and the prototype for the New Testament book of Revelation. One reflects the other. And uh, <coughs> Sir Isaac Newton, uh, who is known for uh, his uh, studies of uh, celestial motion, etc., really devoted his time and his ears to the study of the prophecies in the book of Daniel. Uh, the Daniel, uh, who, who met angels, emissaries of, of, of the Lord, kept pestering them and saying, when is the end of days? I want to know when is the end of days. And he got three kinds of answers, three kinds of answers. And uh, the, the, the most famous or the clearest one was that one in the end to, to get rid of him, the angel said, okay, I'll tell you, the end will come after time, times and a half. <laughs> and, and left Daniel uh, to scratch his head. <coughs> and then uh, Sir Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, who was uh, at the... Uh, at Trinity College in Cambridge, uh, and it's called Trinity College to this day uh, because it was really a, uh, a uh, religious college. And the head of it was, was the, the bishop. Uh, really spent his time and left behind books full of notes where he tried to figure out what did the angels tell Daniel, uh, I have here, I think, that part I, I, I brought with me on a piece of paper. Uh, the, 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 the BBC in, in England <coughs> had a program for Sir Isaac Newton, so at the end they mentioned that he also dabbled in this, actually spent most of the time uh, on that. And they say that he predicted the end of days in 2060 A.D. Uh, it so happened, it so happened that the books or the manuscripts containing his uh, calculations, uh, which was sealed by the bishop and was not al allowed to be opened for 300 years, uh, ended up being donated by somebody who uh, acquired it to the a library in Jerusalem, <coughs> and uh, I obtained a, a, a photocopy of the page with Newton's calculations, uh, front and back. Uh, in one of my talks, I showed slides of it. It's not in my book. The, 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 the picture is not in my book, The End of Days, because I had no right to, to use the picture. And there, he really calculated not 2060, but he said no earlier than and no later than. And uh, without uh, relying on my memory precisely, it's in my briefcase here, but uh, when it comes to 2060, he said not earlier than 2060, but not later than. So his predictions are also are within this century, precisely when. And, and when I looked, by the way, at the back of his, uh, of his page, I realized that he used 2,160, the zodiacal period, as the basis for his calculations, which is exactly <coughs> what I did. <coughs> So the question is, uh, if, if uh, you go along with, 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 with all this analysis and say, OK, uh, so Mayan or Sumerian or, or Sir Isaac Newton or, or, or Zechariah Sitchin, doesn't matter who, uh, something will happen uh, before the end of this century. What is this something? What, what is this something? <coughs> Uh, now, uh, here we come to the question 
of biblical prophecies, and uh, we, which takes us back primarily to uh, uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel, and the so-called my, my minor prophets who followed them. And uh, when, when you deal <coughs> with biblical prophecy, you, you have to take a stand, you have to take a position. Either you say, uh, you know, some, somebody called this or called that, said this or that. Uh, how could he know? What did he know? You know, you, you have to be ultra-orthodox to, to accept uh, a biblical prophecy as really, uh, you know, God, God's word, uh, so forget it. Or you have to say, no, uh, if, you, if you check the record, if you check the record and say, well, those prophets started a millennia and century ago, and not all of their prophecies had to do uh, with the day of the Lord or the end of days, uh, the Jeremiah, for example, uh, predicted the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem and its rebuilding after 70 years. <coughs> what happened to that prophecy? We can check historically whether it was valid or not, and you find that it came true. So uh, you can take the position uh, which I take, and that is that uh, biblical prophecy uh, has to be taken uh, seriously. You know, they say that, uh, I think, uh, uh, attributed to Yogi, Yogi Berra, who said that uh, uh, prophecy is, is difficult, especially if it deals with predicting the future. <laughs> <coughs> so. Uh, it, it, is, it is difficult, but uh, if, you, if you take it seriously, and in that one has to include now, after the book of Daniel, the uh, New Testament book of Revelation. And there, uh, especially in the book of Revelation, they, they bring up uh, a term that is... Uh, uh, frightening and shuddering, uh, and it's called Armageddon. <coughs> now, uh, literally, Armageddon, which is explained in the very text of the New Testament, is the name of a mountain in, in, in Israel. It's Har Megiddo, the Mount of Megiddo, becoming uh, from Har, Har Megiddo, Armageddon, and, 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 and now it, it, in time it, it, it lost its, its v verbal meaning uh, into a concept of, of something terrible, some apocalyptic event that, that will happen. And the predictions are very clear, are very clear that uh, before, before the messianic times, before the, the lamb shall dwell with, with, with the wolf, uh, terrible things will happen on earth. Uh, the, the prophet Ezekiel says the same thing. He said that before the Jerusalem be destroyed for the second time, uh, before Zion shall be a light unto, uh, unto the nations, uh, there will be a, 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 the greatest war ever, ever and he called it the, the War of Gog and Magog. Uh, and uh, when, you, when you read uh, word for word the prophecies of, of, of uh, Ezekiel uh, dealing with this terrible war to end all wars, uh, he says it will be a war that pits nations against nations, plural, plural. And the first nation that he lists is Persia, which is today's Iran. So when I reread the prophecies of, of, of Ezekiel, writing uh, the book The End of Days, I, 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 I shivered. The first nation 
to launch this terrible war will be Persia, today's Iran. Now, did he know what he's talking about? Is this Armageddon? So, <coughs> when we deal uh, with the issue of the return of these gods, <coughs> and people ask me, uh, what will happen when they return? <coughs> My answer is, I really don't know, because I don't know who the leaders on Nibiru are now. Uh, are they the descendants of Enki, or are they the descendants of Enlil? Are they the descendants of the one who said, mankind is not no good, let's wipe it off the face of the earth? Or is it the other guy who said, uh, good or bad, these are our children. We made them, we created them, we are responsible for them, so uh, let's, let's punish them, but not, <laughs> not too harshly. <coughs> so this, this I don't know. <coughs> Uh, I think I, I should add a comment uh, to, to, to make my own thinking clear about the, the, the spate of movies uh, that, that uh, we have been seeing. And I think that uh, the movies about the, 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 the end the, the, uh, fall into two classes. One is that either there will be some natural catastrophe Right, an asteroid will hit the Earth or, or, or something. Uh, and in connection with 2012, the, the name uh, of the planet Nibiru, Nibiru kept coming up. So Nibiru is not coming back for several sev centuries. So that, that, that's out. Uh, the, other, the other genre is that uh, people, beings, creatures, from the other planet, whether it's Nibiru or whatever uh, it, it is, uh, come with, with evil intentions. They come to destroy us. They come to, to suck our blood. We, 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 are, we are food for them. They, they need our water. You know, they, 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 this kind of thing. Uh, now, uh, uh, the, the Anunnaki, if it's the Anunnaki who are coming back, uh, they, they created us, they, they gave us civilization, they gave us knowledge. They, they, are, they, they are not coming back to, uh, to, to, to use us as food. Okay, all right. Uh, so, so that, that uh, creature concept, I, I think, does a lot of harm to, to, to a serious discussion of life on other planets, uh, etc. Uh, so what is Armageddon then? That, that, that all the prophetic books of both the, the Old Testament and the New Testament say will precede, will precede the messianic times. Uh, and, and, and I <coughs> keep thinking and thinking about it. <coughs> and the, the only phrase that comes to my mind is what uh, uh, President Roosevelt said, that the only thing uh, we have to fear is fear itself. Uh, the only thing we have, mankind has to fear is mankind itself. We, we are the danger to ourselves, not, not done enough.